so with that, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, my name is uh, Bruce Mance. I'm an assistant dean in the graduate school. I'm also the director of the postdoc office and the career development office. Today's workshop is just one workshop in our series of career skills uh, workshops in the CDO. And we're going to focus on LinkedIn for scientists. So I hope that everyone was able to uh, get access to the CDO uh, workshop drive folder on Google. That sounded really weird. Uh, the Google <laughs> Drive folder for the LinkedIn workshop has some articles. There are some exercises to do. There's a checklist. After today's session, we will upload the recording and the presentation to that folder too, so you'll have access to all of these materials. Okay, so with that, uh, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. So, before we begin, um, one of the first things that I wanna do uh, is actually do a little poll. So I would like to know from the people who are here today, uh, what are you currently using for professional social media? Um, how do you currently rate your LinkedIn skills? And when you think about using LinkedIn for networking, um, how anxious or worried are you? Do you feel like this is something you can currently use to build and expand your network? So we'll go ahead and leave this open for uh, another 30 seconds or so. So just go ahead and, and rate um, kind of where you feel you're at on these different components. All right, so let me share the results. Okay, so everybody can see this, right? Can I just get a thumbs up or a nod or Austin? See the poll? Yep, we can yeah. see it. Perfect, thank you. Okay, yep. so it looks like most people are currently using LinkedIn, right? So 84% of you are using LinkedIn, uh, about 40% using ResearchGate. So these would be the two main ones. And so I'm glad to see that. Um, again, what we're focusing on is professional social media. I think Twitter is an interesting space because there are a lot of scientists on Twitter and there are a lot of career professionals that have um, active Twitter accounts. And so that can be a place, but really when you're thinking about building and establishing your brand, LinkedIn is gonna be the most important resource that you can have. Uh, currently, people are feeling mostly like they're at the intermediate level, so they may know some things about LinkedIn, how to use it, um, but don't feel like they're really getting the most out of it right now. Um, and then, a little bit of nerves when it goes to using LinkedIn for connection. So the reason I wanted to start with this is that these are things that we're gonna to address today, and hopefully after today's workshop, you'll really feel as if you have a good foundation of how to use LinkedIn for your career, um, and you'll have an increased comfort level uh, with actually being able to use this to expand your professional network. Okay. All right, so let's, let's move on. So what are we gonna do today? So after today's workshop, you're gonna be able to list some of the benefits of LinkedIn compared to other social media. You're gonna be able to apply some of these profile tips. You'll understand best practices for LinkedIn, so how do we use this effectively? Um, you'll begin the process of profile revision, and at the very end, we're going to have some opportunity to get some experience using LinkedIn for networking. So these are our goals today, and if we're successful, uh, I hope that in all these areas, you'll feel like there's been some growth. Um, I want to give credit to Dr. Hannah Hathaway. Hannah is a former postdoc and former president of the CU Denver Institute's Postdoc Association. Uh, Hannah and I built this workshop together. She normally teaches it, but she is a high school biology teacher. Um, and is a little too busy right now taking all of her other things virtual to do it. So um, we'll go ahead and, and dive right in. So why should you use LinkedIn? Well, as you're starting to build your career, as you're establishing who you're going to be as a professional, whether that is uh, a tenure track faculty member, uh, industry scientist, uh, science policy uh, advisor, a consultant, whatever it is that you're going to do, um, you need to start establishing yourself as that professional. And LinkedIn is really how you can do that. Again, as you're transitioning, if you're a grad student thinking about moving into a postdoc, you can use it for this. What do you want to be known for, right? Um, if you're moving into that career, how are people going to find you with those opportunities? So you want to start marketing yourself and establishing your brand. Here's what you do, here's how you do it, and here's who you are. You want to expand and strengthen your professional network, right? So again, I'm sure that you have heard how important networking is for your career. Uh, it cannot be overstated how important that is. And this is true regardless of what you're going to do. Um, the ability to have people who know what you're interested in, 
and can refer opportunities your way, who can give you advice as you're trying to navigate this space. Having that network is one of those things that allows people to thrive. And so um, how do you build that? Well, LinkedIn is one of the great tools in order to build that professional network. Importantly, 92% of recruiters use social media. I think this number is actually higher now than when we originally put this together. Uh, but uh, statistics were that 87% of recruiters use LinkedIn. My guess is that's in the 90s now. Um, again, if you have a strong LinkedIn profile, you become visible to people who are looking for you. Again, recruiters, right, they get paid for finding people who can do the job that the company's paying them to find people for. So if you can hit those benchmarks, if you can come across as somebody who has the right skill set and has the right experiences, opportunities can find you, right? Same way for uh, expanding your network. It's one thing to go out and try to connect with other people, but when you have a strong brand, when you have a strong uh, LinkedIn profile, people are going to connect with you. They're going to ask you for connection requests. Um, so again, having that online presence really becomes critical. LinkedIn is, is a great way to uh, set up informational interviews. I'm a huge uh, proponent of informational interviews when you're trying to navigate a career, finding out what somebody uh, who is doing the job you're interested in actually thinks about it, getting that insider perspective and advice, having that professional connection that can give you feedback on your resume or can refer an opportunity to you, those are absolutely uh, must-haves when you start thinking about transitioning. And LinkedIn is a great way to start the process of setting up those informational interviews. This is a great way to investigate companies, right? So you're thinking about moving into a job. What's that company like? Who works there? What are those industries like? What are those careers like? Like this is, LinkedIn is a great way to start doing that research. So you can figure out, is this really the kind of place that I would wanna work? You can set up job alerts through LinkedIn. So I'm interested in moving into uh, careers as a medical science liaison. But I don't wanna leave the Denver area. So I can set that up within LinkedIn so that uh, opportunities that are posted, positions that are there, I'll get an email notifying me of all those, right? So it's a way that you can find um, job opportunities. And it's the present and the future. This is what people are doing and this is where they're gonna go, right? Like I had this conversation with someone the other day, uh, Indeed and Monster, like they kind of started things, right? But uh, I think the analogy I used is that those were the MySpace, right? Whereas LinkedIn is the Facebook. And so those first iterations of other job platforms, uh, LinkedIn pulls it all together. And so this is going to be the tool that people are going to use more and more. So again, a lot of this is probably not news to you. And knowing that LinkedIn uh, is going to be important, important for you in your career, um, this is just uh, further evidence that you, know, you really want to start establishing yourself from having that brand to finding opportunities uh, as you start to navigate these career transitions. So what is LinkedIn, right? So we, th we think about LinkedIn as being the jack of all trades. So I'm pretty sure all of you have an academic CV. And so this is gonna be this laundry list of everything that you have done in an academic environment since you completed undergrad, right? So this is your full professional history. It's gonna showcase and highlight some of those accomplishments. You may have some references on there. This is the academic gold standard. When you start transitioning out of academic positions though, then you really need to have a resume. And so this becomes a shorter document, whereas the CV can go on for 20 pages. Uh, the resume really is, is two pages, maybe three pages max if you're super accomplished. So you want to have this shorter professional summary. It's skills focused. It doesn't just say here are the accomplishments. It breaks out. Here's what I've actually done. Here are the kinds of things that I can do. Um, and you want to customize your resume for each job posting. Both of these uh, are used in tandem with a cover letter, which is meant to showcase some of your personality, right? Emphasize those accomplishments, emphasize those skills. But this is what LinkedIn does, right? LinkedIn brings all of these things together. We have this, you know, this nice cross section of a cell right here, right? Um, so when we look at this, LinkedIn helps you showcase your accomplishments, um, provide the professional summary, emphasize your skills, and showcase your personality. And so this is the online version. I'm going to talk a lot about uh, this is your brochure, right? This is why somebody should want to interview you for a position or pass along an opportunity for you because this is the kind of information that when used effectively, LinkedIn will capture. So ResearchGate, just gonna to touch briefly on this, um, very common in academia. Uh, that was the second most common one that people are using. Uh, the difference here is that this is very science specific. It's not broad-based skill sets. It's not the kind of things you're um, necessarily professionally interested in outside of your research area. Um, it's a great place, though, to start demonstrating some value. So 
you can ask questions and answer questions. And so there are things that uh, go into establishing your professional network that become important with ResearchGate, but it's really very academically focused. Um, outside of university research environments, people don't really pay attention to ResearchGate, but ResearchGate is another one. And so if you have a LinkedIn profile and a ResearchGate profile, it's good to be consistent across those platforms and link them together. So there can be good things about ResearchGate, but again, it is much more uh, career specific for academic research careers um, than LinkedIn will be. Okay, so this is just kind of the nuts and bolts about why you want to do it. Hopefully I didn't have to do much convincing that this is the kind of thing uh, you really want to have a profile for. So, so how do we actually maximize our profiles? So before we start, so if you're going to uh, try to have your LinkedIn profile open and do any of these things in real time, absolutely I encourage you to do that. But before we make any of these changes, we want to make sure that we update our privacy settings. Uh, and so one of the reasons for that is that there's a setting in LinkedIn that will update your network of profile changes. And as we go through this and as you're building sections out, you don't want people getting lots of notifications that you added an education experience or you added this experience or that experience because that gets annoying. So before you start making changes, we want to turn those off. And so to do that, you have your... Uh, LinkedIn profile, <clears throat> you have the little image, you can click on that image, you would go to settings and privacy, and then it opens up this new window and you would click on visibility. And this section here that is visibility of your LinkedIn activity, you want to turn that no, you don't want to notify people of that. Okay, so that's the first thing that you should do before you start editing your profile. Um, we'll go back to this when you're done editing your profile, you want to remember to put that on. But as you're building this out and getting things established, you initially want to start off not notifying people of all these tiny little updates that you're going to make. Okay. So keywords, right? This is what we're going to focus on for most of your profile. We want to make sure that there's this consistency of who are you and what do you want to be known for, right? One of the reasons we want to do this is because of search engine optimization or SEO. So recruiters, uh, LinkedIn itself, they're gonna be searching profiles for certain keywords. And when you can align those keywords with the kinds of jobs that you're interested in, all of a sudden you start rising to the top of those search lists. Um, specific keywords mean specific search results. So if you have something that says research, okay, great. Uh, but if it is something like pharmacology uh, or uh, in C2 hybridization or whatever it is for that thing, now all of a sudden the people that are looking for people who have those specific skills will start to come across you. You can find ideas for keywords in job postings. And this is part of one of the exercises that we've laid out, right? So you can find job postings, review those, see what kind of skills they're interested in. So you found three different positions that interest you. What are those kinds of keywords that come out there? What are the, what are the skill sets that they're looking for? You can use those then as your keywords on LinkedIn that we're gonna sprinkle in throughout from the headline down through the experience section. You can also look at other people's profiles on LinkedIn. So if there are, uh, if you're interested in a scientist position at, uh, you know, in, in bioscience around Colorado, start looking at the profiles of people that work at those companies, right? And identify, okay, everybody says that they can do these things. Now, this has to be consistent with what you can actually do. Um, but again, making sure that you're highlighting the right kinds of skills becomes important for people to be able to find you. Once you have this, once we have these keywords in here, this is gonna be an exercise towards the end that you can do, uh, but I'll talk about it now. Again, looking at what does your profile say about what it is that you can do? And this may be a great place to start if you wanna see where, how it stacks up right now, but you can use a word cloud to compare your profile to specific positions. Again, so if you're interested in a position that requires a lot of science communication and you don't have anything about science communication in your profile, that's not gonna be a good match. So you can use a word cloud um, to do this. And to do it, you wanna download your profile as a PDF. And so if you, again, from the uh, profile header page, there's this little more section um, and you can save your, PDF, uh, your profile as a PDF. And so that's just a simple download. Once you've done that, then you can go to something like wordclouds.com and upload that PDF of your profile. You click on the word list and this will just go through generating a word cloud. And again, I think this is a really helpful exercise to figure out currently what does your profile say about your skills, abilities, and interests. 
What are those words that come up? What's the most prominent stuff? This is what uh, the search engines are gonna be finding. So you wanna make sure that this is really gonna be capturing the kinds of things that you want it to highlight. So what are you interested in doing? What are the skill sets that you offer? Um, so again, this is a tool that I would say when we are done today, when you feel like you've revised your um, profile, go and especially if you've used some job postings to do that, upload the word cloud of the job posting, upload the word cloud of your profile and see what kind of match you have there. Okay, and again, um, if you have questions as we go through things, go ahead and uh, type those into the chat and we will address them uh, as they come up. All right, so you've turned off those notifications, we specified career goals and some keywords. So now what do we do with that? So, so we have this idea, here are these keywords that are important for us. Well, now we wanna turn these into headlines and summaries. So what's your headline? So your headline is by default on LinkedIn, your current position. So if you go to your profile, chances are it says postdoctoral fellow, see you Denver Andrews, whatever, right? It's just whatever job you had. Um, but that doesn't, that's, can be important um, to include some context about what your current position is, but that's not necessarily going to be the most important thing for defining what it is that you want to do um, or what you want to be known for, right? So if you are currently, um, if you have an NRSA, uh, depending on what is, you may want to get more of that information into your headline. And so again, this is where you would want to put those, if you want to be known as Hannah did, as an educator, a pharmacologist, and a science communicator, those were the keywords that she wanted to have throughout her profile that she wanted to be known for. And so that goes right into the headline, okay? The difference between the headline and the summary is the summary is gonna be this description about uh, a little bit broader of who you are and what you do. One of the cool things about LinkedIn is that um, you can now download a resume. It'll actually use your profile to generate a resume. And if you have a strong summary, that's the information. I mean, even if you don't have a strong summary, um, but the summary information is the top part of your resume. And so there's a consistency there, right? That this is the story of who you are and how you do things. So Hannah's, I'm currently a high school biology teacher at DSST. Uh, before joining, I worked in biomedical research from clinical hematology to neuropharmacology, right? Loves using my broad range of real world experience to inspire and excite the next generation. This is a little bit of information. This is a, a brochure to who Hannah is as a professional, okay? So again, thinking about the summary, you can expand on this section, but you wanna, that's good. So how long should the, su the summary be? So we have some recommendations for that in the, in the worksheet, um, and then we'll get to those in a second. You don't want it to be too long, um, and you can have multiple sections. I'll show you some other examples of these in a second. But when you go to the LinkedIn profile, you want people to see what is visible. Right, so you have all of the things you want people to see right when they go on your profile in those two, two to three sentences. You can click on it and expand it where you can add more information, but you don't wanna rely on people needing to expand your summary to see all that information, okay? Uh, so should all the keywords be in the summary or also in the headline? I would say you wanna pick out the most important ones to go in each section. And again, these are gonna show up in different places throughout your experience. And when we get into the experience sections later on, what you're doing here is you're setting up with this headline and with the summary, your statements about who you are as a professional. Here's, here's what you are known for, here are the skills that you have, here's what it is that you wanna do. The rest of your profile is gonna then provide the supporting evidence to back up those statements, okay? Um, so you, Again, there's gonna be a lot of play with this. This is an art more than a science. Um, and so looking at it, if you have, uh, you know, and really when we talk about keywords, you're saying three to five strong keywords for what it is that you wanna do. Um, and so those could be things that you could get into the headline. You definitely wanna get your keywords into the summary. Whether you put all of them in all places, um, that's probably just gonna depend on how many you identified. So why a headline? D certainly depending on how common your name is, um, this is one of the ways that people will identify you for what it is that you do. Okay, so Hannah's headline here was pharmacology PhD using molecular and cellular techniques to study glial cell development, right? And this is a way for her to identify as what her position is from other people, right? She's not the marketing manager. It's not digital production. Um, is there's even a, a, another 
uh, K-12 teacher here, right? So again, this is what's going to show up in the search results. When people look either for your name or they see similar connections or things like that, the headline is the first thing they're going to see. So this is really why you want to right away start uh, capturing who you are as this uh, emerging professional. Um, the headline is going to be this one-line bio, right? This is the title to your brochure or your trailer, right? This is what you're going to say. Here's who I am. Here's what it is that I do. Um, and so that should set the tone and the expectations for the other things people are going to see as they continue to go through your profile. There's a 120 character limit, right? Which is actually a lot <laughs> um, if you use all of them. So again, you want to look at it and see uh, what fits for you. Um, you could get all those keywords in there if you want, but again, you don't want something that's really wordy because as people scroll things or they're on their phone, you want it to be succinct and clear what it is that you do. Again, we're hitting those keywords. Um, you want to emphasize your expertise, but also your goals. So what is it that you want to do, right? What do you want to be known for? What are the kinds of careers you want to move into? Uh, you want to highlight some of those accomplishments and some of the value you bring. And basically, you want to think about who am I, what do I do, and how do I do it? And those are the kinds of things that you want to try to incorporate as you're building your headlines. So, so what do some of these look like? So these are real headlines, um, some of them from postdocs, some of them from grad students, um, other ones, all people who are affiliated with things. So physician scientists experienced in translational and clinical research, okay? Very clear and to the point, says who I am and what I do. Uh, National Science Foundation fellow pursuing PhD in neuroscience with focus on gliobiology and health and disease. Look, so here somebody got in here that they're an NSF fellow, right? So there's an accomplishment that they put into their headline. Medical writer, science communicator, and Oxford comma enthusiast, right? You can tell this person has a sense of humor. Uh, and again, as you're thinking about that headline, this is going to be very personal. And this, I think, is one of those things that's really important for people when they start applying for positions. Oftentimes, PhDs and, and postdocs focus so much on justifying and demonstrating they're qualified, okay? You wanna go through, I can do this job, I promise you, I can do this job, right? And we forget the fact that anybody who's gonna get an interview can do the job. That's not gonna be the question. The question is gonna be more about who you are as a person. So yes, you absolutely have to be qualified. You absolutely have to be competent and capable in the things that you do. But they also wanna know, how are you gonna be as a teammate and a colleague? How are you gonna be as an advisor or a mentor? How are you going to be as somebody who is a participant on a team? Are you going to be uh, an asset or are you going to be uh, a pain? I, I could have gone another way with that one. Um, so again, thinking about all of those things. Now, you also can include your title, right? So sometimes it is helpful for people to know specifically what is the job that you have right now. And recruiters oftentimes are looking for that kind of information. If you're a staff scientist, if you're a postdoc, especially when you get more into your career, you also may want to include that information. So the way that I, I have an amalgamation for, the, for my headline, right, which is that I want to be known as a leader, a communicator, a mentor, and a scientist. These are the things that I identify as my professional identities, right? But then also, I'm currently an assistant dean and director for these. So you can do this, again, whatever feels right for you. But what you want to get in there is, here's who I am, here's what I do, and here's how I do it. All right, so what's the difference with the summary? The summary is gonna provide some context for that. So you have this statement, this is your title to your film. This is, this is who I am, this is what I do, right? But so, so what? Like in what context and where and how have you been doing those things? So this is where you can add in more information about what you've done and where you wanna go. You wanna highlight um, those different skills, really emphasize the highlights from your profile, the things you're gonna to get to later when you go into experience if you have won awards, if you have honors, if you have uh, big accomplishments or things that you have done, put those out, call them out specifically in that summary, right? The summary in some ways is going to be like the cover letter where you're choosing some of those stories to tell about things that you've done. And then the rest of your profile is like your resume. And here's the, the details and expanded on here's all the other stuff that I've done as well. So this should be a short little read, right? So here we have 30 second commercial. This is the trailer to your movie. Um, but again, this is something that somebody should be able to get that information quickly. So when you look at it, if you have to expand the section to get to the really good stuff, you wanna move that good stuff up into the first paragraph. So as you look through that summary, you can make it a little bit bigger, but you wanna make sure that the initially visible part really starts selling the story. So how do you approach this, right? Do you want it to be all business? Do you want it to be more personal? This is gonna be up to you 
And it's also going to be up to your audience. So if you're trying to break into a sector or a career where everybody is, you know, very formal, uh, very straight laced kind of stuff, and that's maybe that's who you are for one. Um, but two, that's the profiles of people that are working in the areas you want. You want to start being consistent with that. Um, the more personality you can put into this, though, the more you start to stand out from the crowd. So again, you want to think about the intended audience, but you also want to um, you know, share those motivations. Why do you want to work in this field? Why do you want to work on this particular disease state? What is it about this that motivates you, right? So start putting that information in there, but this is up to you. Um, again, you want there to be an authenticity because when things work well, people are going to connect with you. You're going to connect with people. They're going to see the stuff on the profile. When you do have conversations with them, when you do meet them, if you don't, if you, you know, uh, crack a lot of jokes in your summary or uh, insert some humor, but then you don't really have a good sense of humor, there's going to be an inconsistency there that you want to avoid. So you want this to represent who you are. Um, you want to avoid big walls of text. Again, this is not to tell the entire story. You don't need to get every bit of information that you want to get across. You want to highlight things and emphasize the things that are going to be conversation starters. So what do you want to say in here that's going to get somebody thinking, oh, I, I want to talk more to that person. It seems like they do some, some really cool stuff. Or, um, man, they're, they're really passionate about that thing. That, that's great, right? Like, you want to just get short bits of information. You don't want big walls of text. To start this process, you can think about a grad school essay. You can think about your bio sketch, right? In your bio sketch, you're talking about here's what you want to do for your career. Here's why you're motivated to work on this. Here's why you're working in that area. Those are great places to start if you have a research philosophy or a teaching philosophy. The work that you do, those can be great starting points, right? What There's more to it than just the what's of, how, of the skills that you have. It's the motivations behind that as well. And so you want to start using some of that information in your summary. So what does one of these look like? So, so Mark was a former postdoc at CU Anschutz. He now is a health security advisor for the State Department. Um, and this was his profile when he was looking to transition into that career. So he did a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship. Um, so this is his material before he moved into that position, stating where he wanted to go and the, the things that he wanted to do. Some of the things that I like about this one um, is that he really starts hitting, here's where his uh, specific interests are. So a little bit of background on him, um, his interests are the fields of viruses, infectious diseases, and biodefense. Uh, his publications speak to his ability to contribute to a team and execute projects in a timely manner. So that's a statement that he's saying, I'm a good team player and I get stuff done. The rest of his profile is going to provide the evidence to support that statement. So he's saying currently where he's at, right, to do this work, interested in, in global health. Outside of the lab, though, he's involved with the postdoc association. This is reinforcing his ability to be a part of a team, um, supporting professional development. So he's, he's a mentor. Or not, he's an advocate for STEM in the public arena, so communication aspects, which are important for his uh, career goals, long-term goals engrossed in the field of health and human disease, uh, contributing to science and society, and then he has an invitation at the end. New connections are always welcome, right? So somebody reads this, it's like, oh, this guy's happy to connect, right? So you can, this is, and, and I will tell you, this is absolutely Mark's personality. This is who he is. And so when you connect with Mark, you will see somebody who is enthusiastic, is happy to talk about stuff, loves science, um, likes to, to network, is a very extroverted person. Um, so again, the more that you can actually tailor this so that it is uh, showcasing who you are, um, the more consistent everything else then becomes. Okay, so we have a worksheet for this to help walk you through this process. So identifying the keywords, and then once you have those keywords, to start writing a profile. Um, if you haven't had a chance to do the worksheet yet, that's something you can work through after this. Again, one of the things I mentioned is that with this workshop, we're going to set things up so that we can actually get into um, uh, a group uh, on LinkedIn where we can share feedback with people. Okay. So I want to take a second here and just see if anybody did start looking at that worksheet, if they had any questions. Okay. Doesn't sound like anybody had any questions. Probably a sign that nobody's looked at the worksheet yet. That is, that is okay. This is meant to start the process. And one of the things that I do want to say for sure is that going through this and revising and updating, it takes work. It takes effort um, to do this initially. 
it will pay off. Um, so when you start getting into it and you feel like, oh, this is horrible, it, it will get better. Um, and connecting with other people uh, from this, this workshop who are also working on these profiles is a great safe space to test drive some of these things before you go live, okay? So again, uh, be patient and graceful with yourself as you go into this. It does take work to have a good profile, um, but again, the more time you put in now, the better positions you'll be when you start moving along in your career. Okay, so we have a headline and a summary. So now what's the rest of this? How do we actually dive into filling out the rest of our profiles? This is what we're gonna go over next. So adjusting privacy settings. So as I mentioned, we have in the visibility settings, we've turned off those changes. So you wanna go back and actually turn that back on when this is all done. And when you do that, you also wanna check whether your, your profile is public. Um, and so you can have a private mode or a public mode, but the point of LinkedIn is to build connections and to network with people. And so you wanna make sure that your, your profile is public and not hidden. So one question came in here too, I wanna to address, should you be specific in your summary about interests, even if you're interested in a broad area of research work? So I would say, you know, in terms of how specific do you get, you don't want to um, close any doors. So if you can think broadly about a field or a research area or a career topic, so like science communication, that could be medical writing, that could be an MSL, that could be consulting, that's a skill set that covers a, a broader range of career options. So I would say you probably want to uh, be specific so that the right kinds of careers are going to find you, but not so specific that it's only going to be a very narrow uh, subset of those careers that would identify it. So I wouldn't go into the specific proteins that you study. That's not, that's too, too specific, right? So thinking in that sense, what's the broader field? Is it molecular biology? Is it pharmacology? Is it neuropharmacology? That's probably enough detail. Okay. So you want your profile to be visible. You want it to be public because this is, this is what we're using LinkedIn for. For profile viewing options, when you click on somebody else's profile, they can either see um, all of your profile or they, can, they won't see it at all, right? And so uh, one of the best ways to get somebody to go to your profile is to actually go to their profile because when you view somebody's profile, they'll get a notification that somebody viewed your profile. And when you are visible, it's like, oh, why did that person check me out? I'm gonna go see who they are, right? And so when you're going through this, when you're, when you're making connections with people, when you're researching careers or companies, clicking on people's pages is a great, great way to get them to return to your page. So again, you don't have to do it that way. Um, you can have it in private mode, but that's kind of defeating the purpose a little bit. And LinkedIn is for networking, not stalking right? Like you don't want to be creeping on the CEO of Pfizer and checking out their kind of stuff. Like, what's the point? Let them see who you are. Maybe they're going to check your profile out. All it's going to do is introduce opportunity. So this is why it's important to have your profile in order first and to have that strong profile. Because when you start uh, viewing other people's profiles, they're going to start viewing yours. So where do you do this? Same way that we did before. So you would go under your uh, your image for your profile, you click on settings and privacy. This is visibility of your profile and network. So this is profile viewing options, right? So when you're viewing somebody else's profile or jobs, uh, are they gonna see you or not? So you wanna make sure that they can see your full profile. Um, story viewing, right, same kinds of things. Editing your public profile. So this is if it's gonna show up um, in other places. Uh, and again, seeing connections, all of these kinds of things, you can change those restrictions. I will encourage you to be as open and transparent as you can because it doesn't really benefit you if people can't see who you are, okay? But again, there's a lot of customizability that you can have in here. So uh, go through those settings and make sure that you have them set to the, the level you want that's showing the right amount of visibility. Another thing that a lot of people don't do is they don't customize their LinkedIn URL. So when you create a LinkedIn profile, it's going to be linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash your name and then like 475432, right? There's going to be some number at the end of it. And you can customize that uh, to get rid of the number. So this is important for a lot of reasons. One, it makes your profile page easier to find. Um, having your LinkedIn profile uh, on your, in your uh, email signature 
on your business cards, on your resume, on a website. Those are great places where you can start, uh, again, getting people to connect with you and kind of see all that you have to offer. And so having something that doesn't have this long tag of just numbers at the end um, really makes all of that easier. It also looks more pro, uh, professional and what is frequently in job descriptions is an attention to detail, right? Like if you say you're a detail oriented person, the same way that when you say that and then your resume has a bunch of typos in it, when you say you're detail oriented, show them that on LinkedIn, right? Like here's evidence. There's this consistency that you start to uh, cement in people's images and perceptions of you when they see, oh yeah, yeah, no, they have this nice catchy little uh, URL. So to do that um, from your profile page in the upper right hand corner, there's just a button for customizing your edit your public profile URL. Now, if you have a really common name, you may have to come up with some other things. Uh, ideas are though like, uh, you know, Dr. John Smith, Smith JJ, what, you know, whatever it is, um, I wouldn't get all creative with like, you know, some people have Twitter handles that are, um, uh, you know, the reluctant PhD or what, like whatever, like, you know, catchy kind of stuff. Um, I would keep this with your name in it, um, but you do want to try to make it um, shorter and customized to you so that you start standing out and are easier to find. Profile pictures. Okay, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but a couple things to say. So again, this is going to show up throughout the site. Uh, anytime you comment on something, when you connect with somebody on your profile, like this is the image that they're going to see. Um, Profiles that have pictures get more traffic than, than profiles that don't. Um, it puts a face to a name. But this is not a place to really put in those fun pictures unless it is the kind of thing that is very consistent with the kind of career that you want. Okay, that's the one caveat I'll, I'll add to that. But having a professional photo um, is really important for this purpose. Now, through the postdoc office at CU Anschutz, um, we try to do professional headshots once a year. So th that's a great place that you can actually put those pictures in there, those headshot pictures, putting them on LinkedIn is, is a great place to do it. So you can just see the difference here. If Hannah is looking for a, a job as a research scientist or as a high school biology teacher or whatever it's gonna be, the picture on the left, there's no doubt she could be a fun person, but she looks very professional. The picture on the right, I don't know. She looks fun, but you know how professional is she gonna be? So again, Think about having your, um, uh, what kind of image is not just going to represent you, but then also fit with the kind of career you want. Okay, so question about, usually use my full name for papers, diplomas, and official documents, but in person, um, they go by a shorter name. How can they address that in a LinkedIn profile or URL? So I wouldn't worry about that um, too much. So one, you can change your name on LinkedIn, on the profile. Um, if you are... Uh, known for publications and things like that associated with your full name. You can always use that. Uh, and then as people have interviews, interviews or, or connect with you, then um, those are the kinds of things where you can just add in that you go by a shorter version. I, I, would, I would worry less about that for these purposes and go by what you're most, most likely going to be found for. And there's a question about the headshot opportunity. Unfortunately, we couldn't do that this year because of COVID, um, as soon as we are able to host in-person functions again, we're gonna try to do it at that point. So unfortunately, we haven't been able to do that uh, yet this year. Okay, so for pictures, couple tips on this, right? So using natural indirect lighting, avoiding direct sun, pay attention to shadows. So light from windows without harsh shadows. These are the same people, right? You can see how much difference it is when you have a light background versus a backlit um, background. Now, not everybody has an opportunity to get a professional headshot taken. You can use portrait mode on your smartphone to do this, okay? Um, again, the difference between a professional camera and an iPhone, it's not that, it's not that difference anymore, uh, different anymore, and especially as cameras just get better and better. So have a friend take a picture of you if you want a picture in lab, but just go through some of those things of making sure that you have good lighting, that you have the kind of backdrop drop that you want to have, um, if it's something in uh, outside, if it's in the lab, again, things that are going to start helping people see you as the professional that you want to be. Okay, so you can absolutely use a phone. You don't have to have the professional camera. There are also additional things that you can do. You can, uh, 
yeah, passport pictures could be considered professional. I would want to see it <laughs> uh, before I before I went with um, using that picture again. You want you want to be happy with the picture though, because you want to be confident um, of how you're presenting yourself. This is why just a quick sidebar. One of the reasons why uh, attire matters when you go to interview. So how you're dressed matters. It's not about how somebody else is going to perceive you. It's about how confident do you feel. If you have uncomfortable shoes on or you have a shirt that doesn't quite sit right, that's going to distract you, right? So, so feeling comfortable and confident becomes the important thing. And there's that same piece here. You want to find a picture that you like and, and instills confidence in you. So every time you see your profile, you're also reinforcing for yourself, yeah, 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 that's me. I'm that professional. That's what I do. Um, but you can add a header photo. So this is the backdrop behind, normally it's the blue and the bubbles and that kind of stuff. Um, put in a picture that showcases either some of your science, right? So that's what Aaron did, that's what Marnie did. Uh, Sarah here has a picture of the flat irons because that's where she is. Um, I have one of our campus, right? So again, it's that attention to detail that adds a little bit more to your profile. So these are the kinds of things, those little touches that really start to separate you from a lot of other people. Again, for all of these, you just click on it um, where you can add an image and it's really straightforward. LinkedIn is very user friendly to do. So again, completing your profile. We want to keep putting these keywords in there. And, and again, as I mentioned, this is going to be the evidence that supports the things you said in your headline and your summary. You can use your CV as a guide here. So you're going to have education, you're going to have publications, you're going to have honors, awards, you're going to have projects that you did. All of that kind of stuff can go into your experience section. This is really where you want to start emphasizing those skills that you had for each one of the positions that you've held. You always want to avoid large paragraphs of text though, because people aren't going to read it, right? And you may say the best things in the world, but if it's buried in the middle of this, you know, really dense paragraph, nobody's going to see it. So less is absolutely more when it comes to describing your experience section. So use bulleted lists whenever you can. So again, using the CV as the guide, but you only want to put in the relevant experience. So your CV is this, as I mentioned, this laundry list of everything you've done since undergrad. That doesn't mean every single one of those things is important to put onto your profile. So you want to get in that relevant experience that showcases who you are now as the expert that you are and highlights the kinds of things that you want to do moving forward. So having a short description of each position, using those bulleted lists, and then mention in there grants or awards that you receive, right? Like those are accomplishments that can be part of those sections. So Hannah here has her uh, education and training. So this is where you want to link also to the different institutions. So she did her PhD in Georgetown. So she wants to actually have Georgetown as, uh, you know, the Georgetown website as part of that section. Um, adding in here, so again, I'll actually give her a little grief because uh, so she does education and training in reverse chronological order, um, but it's not actually totally reverse chronological. So if you're going to put postdoctoral training as part of your education and training, um, I would put that up above your, your PhD. So everything really is reverse chronological. But a little description of the project that she had, so what she worked on and who her mentor was, right? So when somebody scans the education and training, they'll see, okay, so here's what she got her degree in. Here's where she furthered her training. So they start to see this picture of the, the preparation she has had, the education she has had. For the experience section, here's where she expands on that more. Okay, so the title, postdoctoral fellow, University of Colorado Interest Medical Campus. So one of the things that I really like about this is the first thing you read is an analogy for her work that makes it accessible to people outside the field, right? So analogous to insulation on electrical wires, neurons are wrapped and insulated by a substance called myelin. This is already helping somebody understand what kind of work she does, right? Optimal axonal activity and health depends on the presence of healthy myelin, the brain's spinal cord. Myelin is made of a special cell called oligodendrocytes. So, so again, this is something where she is starting to highlight her ability to communicate her science to people outside of her discipline and her field. A little bit deeper description of that, and then she lists some of those specific skills she has. Right? So again, this is one of those great things that helps a recruiter or helps a company see what kinds of skills that you have and you offer. So, so making sure that you have this brief little description for each one of your experience sections. You also can upload media uploads. So if you published a paper, um, if you uh, made a figure or a graphic, if you have a video or something, you can upload that material. And again, those are those kinds of things that start to add and differentiate 
what you offer and what you've done. Um, so again, anything that you have captured here, I think these are good things to start including. Um, and again, this is really to emphasize, especially if you want to move into like a, a science communication field or something and you put together some really snappy PowerPoint, um, go ahead and put that up there so people can see an example of the stuff that you've done. Publications, don't worry about this too much, right? This is not what this is for. If people want to see your full publication list, they're going to go to PubMed, they're going to know how to find it, right? So you want to capture these accomplishments, but don't dwell on it too much. The format that LinkedIn uses now makes it really hard to see any of these publications anyway. So you have all of it, it just gives this big block of like, here's all the kind of stuff you did. So all that really matters here is that you're saying you have six publications. When you click on this, that's when it actually breaks out to what that paper is. You can link to it. You can see the publication. You can link to other authors and things like that. Um, but again, I wouldn't stress too much about the publications because for LinkedIn, that's not really what you're hanging your hat on, right? Those are, those are things that ResearchGate really cares about. Those are things that academic positions really care about. People who want to see your full publication list, they will know where to find it. If you start telling them more about the work that you've done and you highlight the kinds of things that are in those publications, that's what they'll appreciate. Um, skills and endorsements. This is another area that is often underutilized. So specifically putting out, is it immunohistochemistry? Is it public speaking? Um, what are the kinds of things that you do well? Having those endorsements really adds to your profile. Again, this should be consistent with those keywords. People who have more skills, they get more profile views. You can ask each other, you can ask lab mates and coworkers to give you an endorsement. That is an okay thing to do. Um, you just want it to be honest, right? Like you don't want your mom saying, oh, he's a great, but my mom's not that old. Um, but you don't, want, you don't want somebody who is outside the field saying um, they have great skills with fast scan cyclical voltammetry, right? Because they, that's not a reputable source. So you want it to be somebody who can honestly say, yes, you can do those things, but ask for somebody to endorse you right? And then pay it back. This is one of those things too, that even if it's unsolicited and I don't know, you go to a really good workshop, um, you could endorse somebody for public speaking, right? Like that's one of those things that that's, you know, they ran that really well. That was great. And then all of a sudden you're demonstrating some value. You're starting to build the, the foundations of those relationships and those networks. Um, if you have endorsements that you don't want to highlight, or you don't want, uh, your mom did endorse you for something and you don't want it to show up, you can delete it. They won't get notification that it got deleted. You don't need to worry about that. Um, but you wanna curate this a little bit so that it really is uh, endorsements of your skill set from people who are in a position to actually provide that endorsement. But don't be bashful, don't be shy about it. Ask people to give you endorsements. Recommendations are another level. Um, recommendations, you have to ask somebody to give you a recommendation. Before you would do that, you would wanna talk with them. Um, you wanna give them specific uh, guidance, so to keep it short and sweet, to talk about some specific things that if it's uh, somebody you worked with, if it's a student you mentored, um, if it's somebody who attended a class you taught, um, those are the kinds of things that you would want to provide a little more guidance on. Um, recommendations from peers are great, right? Like if you had, uh, if you're a senior postdoc in the lab and um, a junior postdoc in the lab, you really help them with, uh, with some, you know, learning some new technique or whatever, they may give you a recommendation and that's, that's great, right? And you want to return those favors. So question, what if you have a parent who's in your field um, and you interned at their company? I, so I would shy away from family relationships for endorsements and recommendations. Um, those are the kinds of things that I think, even if it is on the up and up, um, the perception of it probably isn't going to be that, right? So I would look for other people who are at that company who, who might be able to do it, but you're not related to. Um, I think that, uh, you know, endorsements could work for that. Definitely not recommendations, but I think you want to be uh, a little uh, leery of having too many of those as your endorsements, right? So really it's people who wouldn't endorse you for other reasons. Okay, so there are a bunch of other sections on LinkedIn that you can do. Um, you always wanna keep your audience in mind. If you have certifications, you can put those in, um, but it, not everything, right? Because again, you want this to be something that uh, doesn't get overwhelming. Um, one of the things, so if you have additional languages, that can be good, but one of the things I wanna talk briefly about are courses. 
Um, and so you can list specific courses that you've taken. Like if you took a project management course, getting that information on there is important and good. But there's another thing which is really great at CU, uh, which is LinkedIn Learning. And so through the University of Colorado, this is true if you're in Boulder, this is true at, your, uh, at CU Anschutz. I don't know about CSU. Um, but you actually can have access to LinkedIn Learning. So you sign in through the portal. They have a ton of different courses that you can take. And if you complete some of these learning pathways, it actually gives you a badge that shows up on your profile. And so one example we have is there's this learning pathway. I looked up just, you know, develop critical thinking skills. This is a learning path. So it's four hours and 52 minutes. There's six different courses that you would take in there. If you complete all of these, you actually get uh, a certification, a badge that goes on your LinkedIn profile. So they have these for project management. They have these for data science. They have, there are a ton of different things. So if you're looking to, to highlight additional training that you have, this is one of those things that you can think about doing. Okay, so we are rapidly approaching uh, the hour mark. Um, so that's a lot about your profile, right? So once you have your profile in place, what do you really then need to do with it? Um, so that's where we're gonna dive into making connections and using LinkedIn. So who do you connect with? Um, Connect with people that you know? Usually, yes, right? You want to have some kind of relationship with people that you're trying to connect. But a lot of people you're not going to know. So if they're in the same field and you're trying to expand into that, uh, that area, absolutely ask for those connections. When people ask you to connect, that's where you may want to have a little more scrutiny. Um, so uh, again, uh, who you decide to have in your network is going to be up to you. I think there can be benefits of having lots of people, but that's gonna be a personal decision. Um, you wanna be a little bit cautious about uh, people who might be connecting with you because they wanna sell you stuff. Um, but otherwise, outside of that, I think the more connections you have, the better. And again, it's not just about having the connections, it's actually building those relationships that matter. So if you have a thousand connections, that's great. How many of those people do you actually, uh, could, could actually speak to what you're interested in or you would be willing to reach out to to get some advice from, that's what makes for a strong network. It's not just about having connections. So really thinking about this in terms of, you know, who are the people that I know and I want to actually um, have some kind of professional relationship with. When you're asking for a connection, this is what becomes critical, which is to personalize your connection request. So when you reach out to somebody and you want to connect with them, give them some information. How do you know them? Who are you? Why do you want to connect it and what should they do? So if you go to a networking event and you collect some business cards, after that is when you go to LinkedIn and you say, hey, this it was really great meeting you at the Brews and Biotech Happy Hour. I'd love to stay connected on LinkedIn, right? You provided some context, um, just that you're trying to build your professional network, whatever it is, right? Um, that again is one of those things that will increase the likelihood that somebody will accept your request. If somebody sends you a cold connection uh, and, you, and they don't give you any of that information, you might want to think about asking them, why do you want to connect? Um, you can ask for more info and say, hey, this is, you know, I'm just curious, you know, what you're, uh, why you're interested in connecting with me or, or whatever that is. Um, I have had a number of times people that have done that and said, would love to collaborate. And so I'm like, oh, great. And then their collaboration is they want to sell me a product. And so uh, I'm much more skeptical now than I used to be about people who ask who I don't know. Um, about why they want to connect. So, so this is why when you're sending that personalized connection request, you really want to make it clear, I'm in the process of transitioning careers. I think what you do is exciting. I'd love to be connected just to learn more about what you do, right? So you add that little bit of information when you're making the request to connect. Um, once you're connected, then you can send messages on LinkedIn. You can't do that until you have a first connection with somebody unless you pay for premium. I don't think that's worth it. That's a whole other conversation for another day. Um, but so you can pay to have premium and then you can send a message to everybody. Uh, but I don't think that that really offsets the cost. And if you don't want to upgrade, you can make your contact information visible to companies, right? So you can make it easy for them um, just by making that information uh, available on, on your profile. Um, so again, once you have made those connections, that's when then you would reach out to somebody, hey, thanks for connecting. Uh, I would love to, to chat with you sometime to learn more about your career. Would you have 30 minutes in the next two weeks when we could find a time to talk? That's when you make the request for an informational interview is after you have sent that personalized connection request. 
So how do you increase your visibility on LinkedIn? So you have this LinkedIn feed, right? You log in, it's all this other stuff that people have shared. This is a place for you to get active, right? So the more active you are on the feed, the more that you're gonna show up in recruiters search lists. You can share articles. If you come across something you find interesting, push that out to the community. You can write something. I do this not infrequently where I've, I've written an article for the PhD post and then I'll share that same thing on LinkedIn. Um, so if you want to get new content out there, if you want to showcase your writing skills, you can use LinkedIn as a platform to do that. You can comment on things people have shared. Everybody likes to get notification that somebody, hey, thanks, that was really great advice or really helpful, whatever, right? Like you can make a comment on something else somebody shared or you can simply just like it, right? Like so in terms of the uh, effort that it takes, writing something new, sharing something, commenting, liking, it's like from most involved to least involved. But spend a little time on LinkedIn going through, and if you like somebody's article, go ahead and, and share it. Reshare their article, like their article, whatever it is, right? Like that's a way to start being active that starts to demonstrate your value to other people. Because they're, every time somebody shares something, really what they want is for other people to find it valuable. When you show up as one of the people who said, hey, I thought that was valuable, you're making this positive association in their, in their mind. Um, it's a good way to emphasize what you care about, right? So if there are causes or research areas, um, or specific knowledge bases, like this is a place to start establishing that brand, right? You're reinforcing, here's who I am, here's what I do, and here's evidence of that because I like this article, I shared that article, I wrote that article. And you can follow companies or groups to get this information, right? So alumni groups, scientific societies, specific companies, um, the Postdoc Association, the Career Development Office, like these are places where you can get that information that'll start showing up in your feed that gets you established into those communities as well. So again, you want to have a presence. You want to have visibility. You have this profile. You want people to find you. So now you got to start putting yourself out there. Okay. So we are right about at the end. Um, I'm going to share this in the chat in a minute. Um, we have this workshop group and the goal is for everybody to join this group. And again, this is, this is obviously just if you want, but as a way for us to actually put some of this stuff into practice in a safer space with other people who have gone through the workshop and listened to this and, and want to get some additional feedback, um, you can actually join this group. Um, and in the group, I would encourage you to send a personalized connection invite to somebody else in the group. Okay. So just practice it out. Just send somebody a connection. You can send it to me. That's fine. Um, you can send it to anybody else in that group. Um, if you want, the next step is we have these profile review questions. So if you find somebody who's willing to, uh, do a profile review with you. Once you have things set up, we have a worksheet that you can go through that will actually allow uh, facilitate giving each other feedback um, on the reviews that they had. Uh, if you already know people in the workshop, you can give them an endorsement. So these are all different ways that you can start engaging with people in LinkedIn that is through this safe space. This is an unlisted group. So you can only get there by, find, by using this link. Um, you can't, so again, everybody who is in this group has gone through the LinkedIn workshop. Um, and then the other homework activity is in the next week, find an article related to your field and share it on LinkedIn or write a comment on somebody else's article. Again, these are those kinds of things that once you start doing them and once you start doing them in a safer space, you start to build the comfort and confidence in doing it. And again, demonstrating your value, having a strong presence, all of those things are going to be extremely beneficial for you and your career as you go forward. All right. So. Before we wrap up and I take final questions for things, I'm gonna launch uh, another poll. And I wanna know uh, right now, how competent are people in their ability to, to effectively use LinkedIn? Okay. So we're moderately confident, I like it. This is this thing where I think that the foundation is there. Now it's about putting it into practice, right? And we talked about a lot of things I know I talked super fast um, and we went through a bunch of stuff. This material will be available to you in the presentation uh, that'll be in the, the Google folder. But again, this is a chance to start practicing some of this stuff and get feedback from each other, get feedback from people, connect with other folks. The more you use this, the easier and more effective it becomes. Um, so what I wanna do before people start uh, signing off is to uh, share, um, the link to the group in the chat. So I'm going to give that to everybody. So you can, um, that's an easy way to connect and, and to find that. 
And then the last thing I'm going to ask is that um, before you sign off, if you would complete um, a brief evaluation on the workshop so that we can continue to make uh, revisions and, and edits to this so that it is useful for folks. Um, and if you just open that now, even if you don't complete it, it's just six questions. It should take less than five minutes. It's anonymous. Um, if you just put that in your browser, then you'll have it uh, for after the workshop. Um, but join the group, request access to that. We'll grant access, share, uh, connect with other people, practice those things. Um, and when you have questions, let us know about it so we can continue working on um, some of these things. So, so I will take, if anybody has um, questions right now um, that they would like to, to add, you again can type that into the chat. If you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, we can do that right now as well. Um, there's one question about uh, postdoc at National Jewish having access to LinkedIn Learning, and that I am not sure about. Um, so that's something you'd have to look at later. It is something you have to pay for. Um, and so I think that the uh, that would be up to your institution as to whether they have that. And there I just shared the link to the Google Drive folder um, so people have that as well. So if there are questions, we will take them now. If not, I thank you all for coming, um, and I hope to see you at future workshops as well.